<laughs> okay, we are live. Welcome to the Fox Road Seeker podcast. And here we go. Welcome back. This is the Fox Shot Sierra Podcast, and this is your host, Franco Sonera. All right, uh, a few quick announcements as usual. Uh, Instagram, follow me on Instagram at the Fox Shot Sierra Podcast, where this page is practically my website. So you, if you want to know any news or any updates, uh, go over there. Uh, last uh, thing I post was a, uh, a one-minute clip of uh, DL Satan and I uh, breaking down Pearl Harbor. Uh, went to the part where... Um, the Japanese were practically severing their relations with the U.S. So, yeah, give it a check. Uh, YouTube. Uh, YouTube handle is youtube.com slash at the Flockshot Zero podcast. Where you can find me a lot easier than instead of me just giving you a bunch of, like, you know, the YouTube standard. Numbers and letters and all that jazz. Yeah, you don't want that. <laughs> uh, Reddit. Uh Reddit.com slash you slash Fox Shot Sierra Pod. Uh, that's where I post like pictures with the brief description on it. So go over there. Give it a like on your way in. Uh, TikTok. Uh, I don't know how long TikTok's going to last since this whole uh, banning TikTok about to happen. But before it does, uh, check me out over there at the Fox Shot Sierra Podcast. And like and subscribe to the video so I can level up in this bitch. All right. <clears throat> Oh, excuse me. Okay. Okay, let's uh let's go out to last, let's go out to the last episode where we talked about uh the Italian campaign. All right, I'm not gonna get too much into it. Uh we went over uh the Mussolini's arrest and uh well Mussolini was overthrown by his own his own faction, his own uh members of his uh fascist regime, along with the king. They pretty much say, you know what, Mussolini. You are f***ing up way too much, so get out. You're going to jail because we don't want you. you you're, you're being you're being a oh. dumbass. <laughs> so they practically threw him in jail up in the uh, the Italian Alps, but eventually he gets uh, uh, he gets broken out by Nazis led by uh, Otto Kretschmer. I think no, no, I, I forget about this uh, this German commando. Which evidently, after the war, he ends up being U.S. Special Forces. I can't forget. I, I'm having a brain fart right now. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah. So we uh, also we uh, we went over uh, Patton's insubordination. Uh, I mean, like, long story short, uh, he abused a, a couple of soldiers for experiencing post-traumatic stress. You know, their minds couldn't take much longer. The what, reason why, like, Patton decided to stop them, you know, put some backbone in them because. No one understood post traumatic stress disorder at the time, especially Patton. Uh, so uh, Eisenhower and the rest of the Allied leaders were up in arms because, as a general, you don't lay your hands on your soldiers. So they had to uh, make an example out of Patton and suspend him, and he gets replaced by General Clark, uh, who ends up leading the uh, the assault on the Italian, which does not work out for him. Again, go back to the last episode, uh, go in details on it. Uh, of course, we talked about the Canadians in Italy and their roles on it, and we talked about the fate of Mussolini and the Italian army. Uh, Mussolini gets executed by uh, Italian res resistance fighters, and uh, we talked about the remnants of the Italian military. Either half of them broke to the Allies, half of them uh, fought alongside with the Germans till the end of the war. All right. Now, the episode you've all been waiting for, episode 28, The French Resistance. <laughs> okay, well, let's uh, let's go over the facts of the French surrender. 
Well, first off, I just... All right. All right, here we go. Okay, I'm not gonna go get into much, into too much detail on the uh, the the fall of France. Uh, if you want to look at that, if we're looking at expression, uh, exclusion details, uh, the L Saint and I uh, broke it down on uh, his uh, platform, and then I broke it down on my platform. Uh, fall of France. Uh, go back there. I'll go explicit details on uh, on the German Blitzkrieg. Uh, anyway. Uh, long story short, this is this is how um, the Germans invaded France. Uh, they used uh, Armored Group C to uh, keep the Maginot Line at bay and use Armored Group B as a distraction, you know, convincing the Allies that, hey, we're going to do a repeat of uh, uh, the sleeping plan. But not. But actually, Armored Group A is going to bust through the Ardennes and cut the British and the French off. And how did France fall so quickly? Okay. <laughs> um... We all know France today as these, uh, we know France as these cheese eating surrendering monkeys. You cheese eating surrendering monkeys, <laughs> uh, groundskeeping Willie. <laughs> anyway, uh, they got that reputation for the failure in France. Uh, even, even today, like French intelligence love it when people underestimate the French because hey, what did Sun, what, what, what did Sun Tzu say? If you want to defeat your enemies. Let them underestimate you. Okay. But anyway, um, people thought that France was weak. No, no, that's not the case. Uh, French has a far bigger military than Germany, far more tanks, far more troops, far more advanced military technology. And in fact, like France was completely militarized to the tits. Though, but even though, how did they fail so quickly? Well, the French lacked one crucial component leadership the french had none they had great troops but all leadership it was terrible and that's why the collapse of france happened very swiftly okay so to the point where 1.8 million french pow's or prisoners of war were taken so it's a severe blow to uh to any french future counterattacks of course you have uh, over 20 are over 200,000 wounded. And okay, so thus uh, creating the uh, the state of Vichy France, which we will talk about more. Oop, hang on for a sec, guys. <laughs> okay. So let's uh, talk about, um, okay, after the, um, the fall of France, uh, the goal goes on a broadcast on the BBC. So Churchill gives him permission to uh, broadcast a series of powerful speeches to the French people. Uh, so he tries to motivate the French listeners to stand up against their Nazi occupiers. In fact, I kind of want to show you this video. Hang on. Uh, all right. Here we go. And this is by uh, Critical Past. Uh, I have a link over there. Uh, check the stuff out. They actually got some good stuff. But without further ado, here we go. French Legion headquarters sees the birth of new hope for France. Though the tricolor is at half mast, influential younger members of the French forces, including Admiral Musselier, rally to the fighting lead of General de Gaulle. In the name of French honor, this brilliant soldier repudiates the surrender of the border government. De Gaulle calls on Frenchmen to raise again the standard of freedom and continue the fight. Nous croyons que l'honneur des Français consiste à continuer la guerre aux côtés de leurs alliés. Let me read for you. We believe that honor commands all Frenchmen to continue the war at the side of their allies. And we are determined to do so. Et nous sommes résolus à le faire. Nous espérons. We hope that one day superior mechanized strength will give us victory and enable, jour, enable us to free our motherland uh, or fatherland. Une force mécanique supérieure nous permettra d'avoir la victoire et de délivrer la patrie. 
And also, there's more to it than that, actually. In fact, uh, I'm going to read you another uh, uh, part of uh, what uh, General de Gaulle says. Must hope disappear. Is defeat final? No. Believe me when I tell you that nothing is lost for France. Whatever happens, the flame of, of the French resistance must not be extinguished and will not be extinguished. In other words, he says, we may have lost a battle, but we have not lost a war. That quote was from Dugal himself. Okay, so Dugal wanted a professional army formed outside of France. But many French civilians uh, took him at his word instead and began fighting the Nazis and in individual groups or factions. Because you would think the French resistance was like one major group. That's not the case. That there were other factions, which we will break, which we will go into later on. Uh, okay, so the elements of the uh, the French army evacuated, you know, are, uh, are uh, my, I, go to my Dunkirk episode. Uh, again, uh, DL Sate and I break this down. Uh, okay, so Operation Ariel was the evacuation of the Allied forces back to the United Kingdom. Okay, so, but get this. Here's the kicker. Here's, here's things are getting all twisty and all <laughs> up. Okay. So, even though the French were evacuated, uh, like 100,000 of them. Uh, okay. The the French were evacuated. Uh, didn't exactly take the Gaul seriously. In fact, they know who this guy like. Like, who the hell is this guy? Like, he's not our boss. The Times. Which we will discuss more. Okay, so nor the French were unconvinced, or the French troops were unconvinced by his promises. So they're so loyal to their current leader, which is the Vichy government, and the Vichy is collaborators of the Nazis. Okay, okay, so uh, the Gaulle is trying to recruit uh, troops for his uh, for his free French army. Uh, out of the ten thousand Frenchmen. Living in England, only 300 volunteered. And out of the 100,000 troops that were evacuated from Operation Ariel, only 7,000 of them stayed. The rest, they decided to go back to France. Like, I don't know why. I think they were convinced that, hey, um, maybe we can build our home country uh, in France. We can't do nothing in England, so might as well head back home. All to be quickly made into POWs. Dumbass! I know. That that was like when I first read that, I'm like, why? No, but uh there's some French like people like really again really didn't take De Gaulle seriously. They didn't know who he was. Um, in fact, uh they're still loyal to uh their previous leaders, which now is in the hands of the Nazis. The Nazis are completely controlling these guys. All right. So let's talk about Vichy France. Okay, so the red part is the occupied zone, uh, occupied by Germany. Uh, the, the free zone was actually untouched by the Germans. Not yet, anyway, until November 1942. Uh, okay, so here is the uh, three uh, leaders that we want to concentrate on. So you have Philippe Patin, which is, I discussed him back about World War I um, episodes. Uh Patan was known as the hero of Verdun. Like this guy was a rock star, like stopped a bunch of like German advances in Verdun, like completely saved France from being annihilated during the Great War. And of course, you have uh, his uh, deputy prime minister, uh, Pierre Laval. And of course, last but not least, you have uh, Francois Darlan. Uh, this guy is the admiral of uh, the French fleet that is stationed in uh, Miraz al Kabir in uh, French Algeria. Which you'll see right here. Okay. Let's uh, talk about the, uh, the color coding. Okay. The, the, of course, you have Europe. Uh, you have like the uh, Vichy France and Occupied France. And let's look at Africa. Okay. That dark navy blue represents the uh, American gains when the uh, when Operation Torch was commenced. And the green, that's Tunisia, which is completely occupied by the Nazis. And the baby blue, that whole blood baby blue in West Africa. <clears throat> All right. French North Africa and French West Africa were pretty much considered in uh, Vichy hands. 
uh, the red, which is uh, French Equatorial Africa, which belonged to the Free French under De Gaulle. Uh, the pinks uh, also uh, oversees uh, Vichy territories. Uh, you have uh, Gabon, which is uh, that little pink uh, area in Africa. Uh, let, let's read this over here. Okay. Uh, Gabon surrenders after the Free French invade. It joins the rest of the French Equatorial Africa in supporting of the Free French. Now, of course, uh, you have Syria up there, which kind of belonged to uh, the Vichy France. Uh, we're not going to talk well, like, I'm not going to go into explicit details on the Middle East Eastern Campaign and the Second World War. Um, it only lasted three months. Uh, I can give you a little brief breakdown of it. Okay, so you have uh, Syria, which is like belongs to the Vichy France, and Iraq. Uh, which now it ha it's now beginning to ha form its own Iraqi government under under a uh, a pro axis faction. In other words, the Iraqis supported the Nazis. Anything to get the hell away from from British Chris. And so they decided to go up against uh, the British occupiers, which does not last long. Uh, because uh, okay, okay, so Hitler uh, asked Patan to uh sent uh to allow uh the Luftwaffe to station airfields in Syria and to you know help them take on British Iraq. The Vichy France have no problem doing it because in return they get their French POWs back. Of course that's not the case. Uh the British invaded Iraq uh and then they invade Syria through Egypt and now Iraq's taken and Syria's taken, and now it's in both in allied hands. So, Bataan gets over and does not get his French POWs. Okay. Well, let's talk about the, uh, the Vichy, uh, Vichy France. Okay. What is Vichy France? Okay. After the armistice signed with Germany, uh, de Gaulle was hoping that the leaders like uh, Marshal Philippe Bataan uh, and other French leaders from the old government, government was secretly pick up the pieces and join him and be able to, to continue the battle as an armed forces. Unfortunately, that was not the case because the Vichy government was, because uh, they thought, uh, Dugal thought uh, the Vichy government was playing cooperation with the Nazis, but was secretly working for him all this time. But of course, uh, in the end, Patan and uh, these jackals were nothing more than traitor rotten Nazi collaborators like the French don't like them. <laughs> and with good reason okay so uh the Vichy France these guys like practically were volunteering to do what Germany says they go as far as okay well during the uh the armistice that the French had to sign with the Germans okay oh, 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 oh okay 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 let's talk about how the French surrendered to the Germans Oh, it's it's kind of poetic justice uh, if you look at the, at the Germans' point of view. Uh, okay, so during World War One uh, on November 1918, uh, Germans were forced to sign a uh, an unconditional uh, surrender with the French and the rest of the Allies at uh, this railway cart and uh, Copenhagen. Uh, again, after the fall of France, the Germans got that same cart from the museum, brought it into the same very spot at Copenhagen. I think that's how you pronounce it. And made the French uh, sign an unconditional surrender in that train a couple decades later. Over a couple decades later. Talking about poetic justice, huh? Like a tit-for-tat karma uh, for the French. That's how the Germans wanted to uh, to see it say yeah you got us now we got you and guess what we're gonna fuck you just how much you fucked us with the treaty of versailles and they did they absolutely did okay and what happened to this train cart well uh the germans decided to uh throw in the scrap and destroy it the reason why they destroyed that train cart because it brought so much shame to germ to uh to germany it it's like a uh an unwanted scar that they want to get rid of. So they got rid of the cart and never to be seen again. Uh, okay. I also want to add something to that as well. Um, 
Oh yeah, okay. And you're probably okay. Vichy France voluntarily sending French Jews to Germany. And it was delivered by French hands. And these French hands was known as the Maquis. Oh, sorry, the, not the Maquis. Uh, I don't know. Oh, so as the Malice. That's it. Sorry, the Malice. Uh, the Maquis was a French resistance group. Uh, okay. Yeah, let's talk about the Malice, shall we? Uh, think about the Malice as uh, the French version. Uh, the French version of the Gestapo. Okay, so it was a parliament military organization formed in March 1941. Uh, it was led by uh, Pierre Laval, which is the guy in the middle. Uh, however, it was commanded by uh, Joseph Darnon. Uh, Malice co- uh, the Malice collaborated with the Nazis and participated in the extermination of Jews, gypsies, and other ethnic minorities. And also... These guys were responsible for rounding up men of military age, like 18, 20 years old, to go work in Germany and eventually get conscripted into the Wehrmacht. Okay. So, if you're a Frenchman, or a very young Frenchman in his early 20s, most likely you're going to be selected to go to Germany or being forced to fight alongside the Nazis. So what do you do? You run for the hills. And you form a guerrilla resistance group called the Maquis. And, oh, look at that. A whole bunch of French resistance groups. Okay. So you have uh, Charles de Gaulle, the leader of the free French forces that the Allies did not want to recognize yet. And of course you have uh, Jean Moulin. Uh, who is Jean Moulin? Uh, so he had become a symbol of the French resistance and not and, uh, to the Nazi occupation. Uh, his role uh, within the resistance was to unite all of these, uh, all the French resistance that I have labeled. Okay, so let's go over these guys. Okay, you have the uh, Liberty, uh, Liberty, uh, Liberation Nord. Of course, uh, you have you're basically socialists and trade unions. Um, let's say for me, for example. I'm a tradesman. I work in, in construction. I am a mechanical insulator. So if I was living in France during that time, most likely I'd be joining these guys. And the next on the list is you have the uh, the Front National, which are pro-Soviet communists, uh, which led by a man named Colonel Roll. That was his nickname. And you have the Resistance, which is a bunch of Roman Catholics. Uh, you have the Army Juve, which are French Zionists, of course, uh, Ju- French Jewish fighters, and you have the Resistance Fed and the Chamois, which are railway workers. Uh, these guys are pretty interesting. Uh, these guys were heavily involved in sabotaging the train tracks, preventing from French Jews to going to Germany. Also, these young innocent, innocent Frenchmen going over to Germany, being forced to go over to Germany to work. And again, evidently being conscripted to the Wehrmacht. So, uh, the Resistance Fair and the Chamois did everything they could to stop these trains. All they did was slow them down. But their defiance marked their names in history. And last but not least, the Maquis. French guerrilla fighters. And the Maquis is uh, consistently based on the Frenchman that I was telling you about, the 18, 20 year old kids that are trying to be forced to go into Germany. Hail! <laughs> no. They rather go head to the mountains, freeze their asses off in the French Alps, and take their chances. And, and of course, uh, the Maquis also uh, marked their names in history. Uh, when uh, Paris was uh, being liberated, the Maquis decided to uh, come out there, come out of the hiding spots and attack the Nazis head on. Like these were some brave mother <laughs> right here. But unfortunately, uh, the Maquis uh, faced a grim fate. They were against a mechanized professional army. These guys are just guerrilla fighters with like grenades and rifles. 
up against tanks and machinery. Yeah, again, they they even though they uh they got the ass whooping though, but they definitely did a lot of damage to the Nazis. That's a damn sure. Oh, uh, that's what I wanted to show you. Okay. Let's uh, talk about Operation Streamline Jane. Okay, Operation Streamline Jane is a British amphibious invasion in Vichy-held Madagascar. Okay, so if you know where Madagascar is in the map of Africa, it's on the uh, the East Coast. In fact, I'm going to bust out Google Earth for you because we are about to go around the world, baby. All right. Share screen. Window. Here we go. Guys, like the video on your way in. Pretty please. All right. Anyway. Damn. I need, I really need it. I really need, need multi screens here. All right. So if we go to Africa over here, and if you haven't seen the movie Madagascar, for those that haven't done some more Madagascar is, is this big island right here. And of course, it's on the east part of Africa. So why did Britain why did Britain invade Madagascar? Well, they feared that the Japanese Navy would use the Vichy ports as a naval base. So they they they're not gonna chance it. So they decided to uh, invade the islands. Uh, it lasted from the 5th of May to the 23rd of September, 1942. Uh, so uh, the British assault, uh, they assault, uh, they assault uh, Diego, uh, the city called uh, Diego Suarez. Uh, which is uh, right up here. Of course, these, these names are completely changed to uh, the dates that they are right now. Uh, so that happens on 5th of May, 1942. Operation Stream, uh, 10th to 11th, 11th of, of September, 1942. Uh, invades uh, Majunga, right over here. And then you have Operation Jane, 18th of September. Uh, over here, they invade uh, Tamatav. And Operation Jane, uh, sorry, Operation Line, uh, advanced to uh, Tananarev, which is right over here. On the 23rd of September, 1942. Okay, so uh, the, the, the three-stage assault of that island was completely successful. And of course, uh, de Gaulle wanted to establish his free French uh, headquarters over Madagascar. And evidently, uh, Algeria. Though, but, uh, but the Allied leaders didn't really recognize de Gaulle fully as the free French leader. So... What did, what did the Gaulle do? He wants to call the Allies bluff, saying, all right, you know what? You guys, if you're going to play this stupid-ass games with me, okay, I'll just go to Moscow, talk to Stalin, and establish my uh, my temporary capital in Moscow. I'm pretty sure he won't mind. <laughs> and the Allies, Eisenhower himself, were like, What? What the fuck? Whoa, 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 whoa. Don't, please, don't, no, no. And in fact, okay. Don't go to Russia. Go to Madagascar. In fact, they, they were fearing that uh, he was signed with the um, the communists. Though, but the allies, well, the allies completely quickly changed their mind saying, okay, 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 fine, fine. You, you can set up in Madagascar and we will recognize you to go until in their heads, like, unless we pick another replacement. Because the girl really didn't get along. Like, like the rest of the allies really didn't get along with it. It was, how you say, uh, strong personalities just clash with one another. Like, trying to decide how to fight the war and such, right? And, oh, uh, the, um, what do you call it? Oh, I, I forgot to mention this. Um, the, um, the code or the um, I say the uh, 
Uh, the title of uh, sending these uh, 18, 20 year olds to Germany was called the Relev Scheme. There. There's a name for that. I totally forgot to tell you guys. Sorry, my bad. Me being a dumbass. <laughs> and all right. And there's another video I kind of want to show you. Uh, this video over here is presented by uh, this YouTube this YouTuber called the Armchair Historian. Uh, really good stuff. Go over there, give him a like, follow him. Um, and this video, uh, he actually um, describes uh, Vichy France and its role during the war. Uh, without further ado, here we go. An old man looks out the window. Bright July sun dances across the waves. And the sound of surf gently breaking on the island's shore fills the bedroom. But it is not a pastoral seascape the man sees. Marshal Philippe Pitain looks out of a window to his past. To the glory he won at Verdun. To his tenure as Minister of War and then to the fateful election that gave him near absolute power over France to his collaboration with Hitler, to participating in the slaughter of his own people, the despoiling of his own nation, and when the army of free France returned to civil war. As Pitain closes his eyes for the final time, so does it close a conflicted life led by a man who believed resolutely in the necessary actions of Vichy France. With that, the leader of an often overlooked Axis power goes to his final rest. Pretty deep introduction, huh? Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian. To say the Second World War was a difficult time over for France, as the German... I just skipped over because uh, he was sponsoring uh, NordVPN. So, but, yeah, if you want NordVP NordVPN, go over to his link, sign up. But anyway. ...army fought their way across France in May of 1940. The government of the Third Republic was in turmoil. Opinion was split on whether to keep up the fight against Germany or sign an armistice and pick up the pieces afterward. Prime Minister Paul Renault was of a hawkish bent, but faced stern opposition from his newly installed deputy, Marshal Philippe Pitain. Okay, so, um, let's go over here. Uh, Pitain led the French army to a famous Bacasse victory of Adon, which saw him elevated to commander of all French military forces. Again, uh, this hero that the French look up to at the time wants to surrender to the Germans. But you have uh, Renault, uh, the prime minister of uh, France. Like, he wants to continue to fight. He knows what's going to happen to uh, France. Though, but a lot of people right beside him wanted to surrender to the Germans. Pitain was loved by the French people for his successes during the First World War. And Ooh, what'd I tell you? It had returned to Paris following a stint as ambassador to Francoist Spain. Pitain argued vigorously for an armistice, portraying it as a way to halt the carnage and allow the French people to begin the process of rebuilding. As his ministers debated and the Germans continued to advance, Renault began to realize the hopelessness of his situation. On May 26th, Renault took a meeting with Winston Churchill, where the embattled French Prime Minister told the British representative that while he was against signing a separate peace with Germany, the French military had no hope of triumph over the Third Reich. Mm -hmm. And though Renault would not negotiate with Hitler, he was surrounded by men who would. The British would encourage Renault to keep up the fight one way or another until the bitter end. Mere weeks later, the Germans reached Paris, forcing Renault's government to relocate south to Tours. The collapse of France was imminent, but the debate over whether or not to sue for peace continued to rage. The pro-armistice faction began to espouse the view that if they stayed and negotiated, the French could, somehow, control the outcome of the peace talks. By engaging with the Germans and signing an armistice, they could have a say over their destiny. 
Alternatively, the government could withdraw entirely to London, and Renault could lead a French government in exile alongside the Polish. That's what de Gaulle wanted to do originally. Uh, but instead, uh, the French didn't want that because they think that uh, we're, we're not going to be as effective having a temporary capital in London, but we might as well stay in France where we have more control of whatever we had left. And of course, uh, Anglophobia. Uh, you know, the French really didn't like the, the English much, so that's why they really, uh, they're somewhat against moving their capital to London. This view was unpopular due to the aforementioned delusion of control, as well as simple Anglophobia. what I tell you? <laughs> Besides, the argument for fleeing was answered with a simple fact. A French government in France would be more powerful than one in England. As Renault tried to find a way out, tried to settle on a definitive course, he began to find himself squeezed in a vice. Pita and other high ministers began publicly campaigning for an armistice. The deputy prime minister declaring his intent to remain in France and share the French people's fate and suffering. After so much... That is one committed dude. I'll tell you that right now. ...deliberation and debate, after so much pressure and so much back and forth with Britain, Renault resigned on June 18th. Pitain was asked to form a government, and the new prime minister set about obtaining his armistice. The Third French Republic and Nazi Germany would sign the armistice of June 22nd, 1940. On, well, June 22nd, 1940. In a move of petty humiliation, the Nazis hosted the signing in the same train car that had witnessed the surrender of the German Empire in the First World War. Treaty of Versailles. All fighting in France would cease, and the French would make Germany whole for the cost of their upcoming occupation. Patel's ascension after Renault's resignation gave him the requisite powers to negotiate this unequal treaty with the Nazis, who recognized him as the proper authority to treat with them. A number of French military and civilian ministers, as well as rank-and-file soldiers, fled the country to establish the Free French, under former Undersecretary of War Charles de Gaulle. De Gaulle's group would find little recognition in the Allied camp, with the Free French denied the status of government in exile that would legitimize them. Internationally, Pétain was the legitimate leader of France. Which is why only 7,000 out of the 100,000 French stayed by de Gaulle's side. As the armistice came into effect, the Germans began the military dismemberment of their conquered foes. The French army was disbanded, save for 100,000 men who would perform internal security duties. Does that sound familiar to you guys? Treaty of Versailles. French did it with the Germans, and now G Germany can do it right back to France. The French Navy was ordered to pull all of its ships that were abroad for mothballing a demand that the British would not accept. A number of French vessels were stationed in British ports, and the Empire feared that the Germans could use a stockpile of French warships in future battles in the Atlantic. Of course, uh, Churchill feared that Germans would use these ships to uh, launch Operation Sea Lion, uh, the amphibious, amphibious invasion of southern England. The result was Operation Catapult, an attempt to neutralize the French Navy by any means necessary. French vessels in British ports were seized, while a large squadron in Algeria was set upon by the Royal Navy. The British offered to escort the French to ports in Britain, the United States, or even the French possessions in the Caribbean. French Admiral Francois Derland ordered his men not to comply. Uh, uh, Delant was uh, pro Vichy, so he was loyal to uh, Pétain and all those cats. And the British attacked their erstwhile allies. Because remember, they gave an ultimatum. You either come with us or we're going to destroy you. Of course, Dar Darlant really didn't take them seriously, so they s stayed in. And the British eventually opened fire because they're not going to take any chances. Darlan was incensed and ordered the French Navy to attack the Royal Navy on sight. 
Meanwhile, in one of history's many parallels, the crisis gave Pitah his opening to acquire absolute power. The the attack on the French ships gave Pitan uh, gave Pitan an a an opportunity to acquire more power. Does this sound familiar, guys? The Reichstag fire, the Reichstag fire decree. This is how the Nazis got into power within Germany. Watch my episode on the Nazi aggression and the rise of the Third Reich. I go explicit details on that. Patah severed diplomatic relations with the British over their attack in Algeria and ordered an ultimately ineffective bombing of Gibraltar in retaliation. So I know they bombed the living out of Gibraltar, though, but it, it was ineffective. My Gibraltar's still there. They're still pumping supplies in and out. Pro-German sympathies had begun to manifest in Patan's cabinet, with many coming to believe Germany would win the war. France. Oh, so at this point, yeah, okay, I'm going to continue the video. It must opportunistically make her place in Hitler's Europe or be relegated to the dustbin of history. So again, this is right here, right here. Remember that. This is why the Bishop France was so voluntary collaborating with the Nazis. Because in their minds, okay, if we're going to be in a Nazi-controlled Europe, we still need to make our mark. Well, we, we still I said we still need to make our mark in this world today. Because if we don't, France, whatever's left of France, will be just another collapsed civilization. Excuse me, it will just be another collapsed civil civilization in the his history books. Like the Persians and the old Egyptian Empire and the Byzantine Empire and the Roman Empire. But Tom didn't want that same fate. So this is why he did what he did. The fighting on the seas of Algeria had also bred a sense of alienation in the French cabinet, with the Royal Navy's actions seen as proof that France had been betrayed by the British. Deputy Prime Minister Pierre Laval rammed through a quartet of laws that gave Bataan the power to appoint and dismiss ministers and unilaterally enact legislation, dissolved the French Parliament, and empowered Bataan to appoint his successor, who just so happened to be Laval. Again, this is exactly what the, what the Nazis did during the uh, the Reichstag fire. Exactly this right here. The dictatorial laws went into effect on July 10th, and Vichy France was born. With their fa a French version of Nazi Germany. Let's just call it how it is. Fascist future secured. Patel's government set about building a new ideology of hate and acting on it. Like their German partners, the Vichy government sought to weave a narrative around their loss that would bring their chosen people together. The loss to Germany was blamed on the enemies of the homeland. Jews, communists, expatriates, and others. Oh, I guess they are acting like Nazis. This is exactly what the Germans did. This is, this is how exactly, sorry, this is how, what not, this is what the Nazis did. Correction. Uh, this is what they said. This is why we lost World War One. The Jews, the Gypsies. <laughs> but yeah, so Vichy is doing the exact same thing as creating division within Vichy France. With their targets identified, the Vichy regime set about enacting their own. Okay, let's uh, what, read read this quote over here. Uh, Anti-Semitism was not introduced to France France by the Nazis. Uh, the uh, the Dreyfus affair saw a Jewish officer falsely accused of espionage, and his conviction upheld even in the face of clear evidence evidence of his innocence. So, uh, they're at this point they're looking for anything to uh, deport French Jews. Own version of the Nuremberg Laws. First regime set about enacting their own version of the Nuremberg Laws. One more time. The Vichy regime set about enacting their own version of the Nuremberg Laws. Again, copy and paste the Nazis. First, public servants had to prove their father was French. Then, the government began stripping naturalized Frenchmen of their citizenship, many of whom were Jews. 
Then, French Jews were excluded from public office and all occupations that influenced people, barring Jews from academia, journalism, and the French film industry. With these laws in place, the Vichy regime promised to return France to true French people. It was these true French that formed the Malice, a fiercely collaborationist paramilitary organization. Headed by Joseph Darnon, a veteran of the First World War, the Malice were radically conservative and Catholic, condemning in their oaths of induction such evils as communism, Freemasonry, and Jewish leprosy. Okay, what makes the Malice so dangerous is these are French men who grew up in French, who understood the country, who understood, who understands the culture and understands its people. If you want to see a dangerous Axis enemy, it's the Malice. Though banned from operating in Nazi-occupied zones and originally distrusted by the Germans, the Malice would be embraced by the Nazis after Darnall swore a personal oath of fealty to Adolf Hitler. This feudal arrangement would see Darnall made an officer in the SS and the formerly unarmed Malice outfitted with German weaponry. Okay, here's the quote right here. Uh, Darnall is the only collaborationist leader to lay his metaphorical sword at Hitler's feet, an act that drove a wedge between him and Pierre Laval. So, what is he? what, what does he meant by that? Right, his metaphorical sword at Hitler's feet and they drove a wedge. Okay, so... He's more loyal to Hitler than he is to Laval, like supposedly his boss. And that was a huge concern for Laval. Collaboration would only grow more murderous as the Holocaust began in earnest. Though nominally independent, Vichy France had a stated policy of concession and collaboration, a policy that only intensified as the war progressed. Beginning in October 1940, foreign Jews still living in France were interred by Vichy and German authorities both, a state of affairs that would continue until summer of 1942, when Hitler ordered the total annihilation of European Jewry. Patal's government didn't so much partner with Germany in enacting this order as totally subordinate themselves. Vichy France became the only unoccupied nation to actively round up and export its Jews for slaughter, almost viewing it as a question of sovereignty. Again, why did the Vichy French do this? Well, again, they don't want to be erased from the history books. They don't want their civilization collapsed. So, that's why they volunteered themselves completely to the Nazis. Their issue wasn't handing over Jews to die, it was ensuring French hands delivered them. Pierre Laval encouraged the Nazis to take as many Jews from Vichy France as they could, even pushing them to expand the parameters of their deportation mandates to include children. The Patal government received many reports on the existence of extermination camps, so it is highly unlikely these demands were made from a place of ignorance. This is supported by Laval's rejection of an American offer to accept 1,000 children of deported Jews as refugees. Laval decreed that only verifiable orphans would be given to the Americans, but since the Vichy government could not trace deported Jews to determine whether or not they died, they never allowed the Americans to take a single child. So the, um, that's very interesting. Um, since that happened, uh, the, the the civilians who li who lived in Vichy France that were really against both the governments and their and the occupiers of the north, uh, they decided to uh, take these Jewish children in and pretending to like like it's their own children, their own Catholic children. That's another uh, defiance that the French brought towards uh, the Nazis is hiding Jews in plain sight. Now, of course, there was uh, other uh, resistance and resistance methods and beginnings, starting by um, by radio, by leaflets, propaganda, and until like 1943 it becomes more advanced, like uh, hit and run tactics, sabotage, uh, guerrilla warfare tactics. 
Not everyone was as eager to assist the Nazis in their plans. René Bousquet, chief of police for Vichy France, actively sought to prioritize the deportation of foreign-born Jews over French ones due to his knowledge that he was sending them to their deaths. A kind of gruesome patriotism in the face of the Holocaust. Bousquet would go on to ignore German demands for access to lists of Jews as the Vichy state began to collapse. But more on that later. After the war, Bousquet that is interesting. It was tried for collaboration, had his sentence commuted due to his isolated instances of resistance, and was ultimately charged with crimes against humanity by a new tribunal in 1993, only to be assassinated days before his second trial. Oof. Even though uh, he uh, collaborated with the Nazis, he did what he could to uh, not deport French Jews over, only foreign-born Jews. And even though, hey, still, you committed murder, dude. Accountability must be placed. As the Vichy made war on the enemies of the homeland within, they also fought against Germany's enemies without. April of 1941 saw an anti-British coup in Iraq, an event the Germans were eager to capitalize on. Ger so, like I said, the Iraqis... Uh do an uprising. Uh, the Iraqi want to have their own government, their own pro-Axis government, which the Germans want to take advantage of. Germany offered the Bataille government a release of French POWs if they would allow the Luftwaffe to operate out of French Syria, a deal the Vichy readily accepted. German planes... Of course they accepted it, because, dude, they're, 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 willing to, they're willing to do anything to please the Nazis. ...were in position by early May, and the Vichy French and Nazi Germans... Were and of course, the reason why uh, they were so openly willing to collaborate with the Germans because they were convinced that, hey, the more we collaborate, the better of our chances of our getting our POWs back home. That was not the case. Let's just call it a vision for how it was. A place for Germany to suck the resources out. Milk the fucking country dry. That's all it's meant for. And of course, uh, Patam, with his head up his ass, like, doesn't even realize that. Or maybe he does, though, but he probably uh, went ostrich mode. Buried his head under the sand, pretending, you know, not, nothing else is happening. Went on to utterly fail in their objectives. The British crushed the revolt and followed up their victory with a joint Free French-British invasion of Syria and Lebanon. Just over a month later, the Allies were in control of both colonies, and for all their trouble, the Vichy French received absolutely nothing from the Germans. From 1941 to 1942, the small Vichy garrisons throughout Africa would see minor action as British forces attempted to keep them corralled. Though the British initially were able to completely blockade the garrison in Djibouti, for example, Japan's East Asian Blitzkrieg forced the British to reorganize, and the blockade of Djibouti was abandoned, allowing the fascist French to send intelligence on British naval movements through the Suez Canal to their German allies. This would not be the end of Vichy troubles, however as the British launched an assault on the island of Madagascar, long held as a French colony and loyal to Bhutan. On May 5th, British forces landed in an attempt to deny the Japanese friendly ports so close to shipping lanes in Southeast Asia. The British were able to seize the island, but did so without consulting their junior partner, de Gaulle. The leader of the Free French made an open overture to the Soviet in response, indicating a leader of the Free French made an open overture to the Soviets in response, indicating interest in re-establishing the Free French headquarters in Moscow. The British, like any scared partner, bought de Gaulle's affection by naming the Free French as the new government in Madagascar.
As the Cross of Lorraine was raised over Madagascar, the Allies laid plans for another offensive in Africa, one that would ultimately lead to the dissolution of Vichy France. In November 1942, the Allies launched Operation Torch, the invasion of North Africa. Allied forces swept into the Vichy French territories of Morocco and Algeria. And the Germans decided that an invasion of southern France would likely follow the Allied attack. To prevent this, Hitler ordered Case Anton. The I totally forgot my, my mic was muted. Oops. <laughs> Dumbass. <laughs> All right. Um, hang on. What was I saying before? Before the shit was muted. Oh, okay. This. Um, yeah. As I was saying before. Um, so uh, de Gaulle openly suggested to uh, Stalin that, you know, I was set my headquarters to, in your capital. And of course, uh, the rest of the Allied leaders were like, okay, okay, de Gaulle. Okay. You got us. We'll recognize you. Just stay away from the communists. <laughs> the military occupation of Vichy France. So, and okay, start that again. Is Anton. They immediately follow the Allied attack. To prevent this, Hitler ordered Case Anton, the military occupation of Vichy France. So, Germany is in breach of their own armistice. Technically, they're not supposed to be doing this, though, but. The Nazis, they, they're they not honor-bound. They're going to do it anyway, because Nazis have no fucking honor. Let's just keep it a thousand. And the reason why they invaded Vichy France is to deny allies an opening to southern France, and eventually into Germany. As the Nazis goose-stepped into Vichy territory, several of Pétain's advisors encouraged him to flee to what territory they still held in Africa, but the collaborationist dictator refused the Vichy state began to rot from the inside under German occupation. Pierre Laval, buoyed by French fascists who hoped to ride his coattails, ascended to the role of prime minister, succeeding his pal Pétain. But the two... All right, again, Laval had previously been dismissed from a government due to his poor relations with Pétain, but he's back now. Okay, so he was in and out. Two were little more than figureheads to deliver German orders in French accents. So, uh, the, the Vichy, uh, government officials were still technically in power, though, but, again, as what, uh, the armchair historian says, uh, they're just merely barking German Nazi orders and French accents. So, in other words, these guys are just merely more than hand puppets. Vichy authorities began to chafe under their newfound yokes, with government offices dragging their feet on German orders or passively refusing to comply with their former partners. Others took more direct action. Admiral Darlan, who in the time oh, between his private this is gonna be interesting. war on the Royal Navy and Operation Torch, had served in a number of government posts, was in Algeria when the Allies made landfall, and decided that his coat could use a good turn. At his uh, zenith in 1941, Darlan was temporarily made Prime Minister, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of the Interior, and Minister of Naval Defense all at the same time. Darlan made contact with the Americans, and the two negotiated the sweetest of sweetheart deals. The Americans would back Darlan taking control of French North Africa, and he would rally support for the Allies on the ground. So... Instead of uh, de Gaulle leading the uh, Free French, they wanted this guy to do it. Even though he was pro Vichy, this guy enforced the anti Semitic laws. Like, this guy's another rotten POS that I don't know why. Like, like do you hate de Gaulle that badly to, in order to re replace him with this guy? Or at least try to? I don't know, you tell me. Their law would never get the chance, however, as an anti Vichy assassin slew him in December of 1943. Merry Christmas, Darlaw. <laughs> Christmas Eve. This is when Darlaw got assassinated. Because, again, they, they, they don't want this guy in power because they remembered him. They remembered how he treated them. And guess what? They slayed him. Rightfully so. 
As the Germans began exercising more and more direct control over Vichy France, their collaborators began vying for power in Vichy circles. This led to infighting that culminated in an attempted coup by Pétain against his former deputy. Pétain and a cabal of ministers reasoned that perhaps Germany wouldn't win the war after all, and if they could wrest back control, Vichy France could open negotiations with the Allies and control the outcome of the peace talks. A uh, little late for that. Hitler knew of Pétain's plan and explicitly warned the Marshal of the consequences of failure. So naturally, Pétain went ahead anyways, and the Germans ensured he failed. The Marshal was imprisoned by the Germans, whose price for saving Laval's diminished position was the installation of Parisian ministers loyal to Germany. Overall, most Vichy ministers stood by their government for various reasons – indoctrination, guaranteed pay, or the safety of their families. This loyalty kept the Vichy regime on life support until Operation Overlord. As the Allies drove into France through the summer and fall of 1944, Pétain and Laval were forcibly removed to Germany. The Germans re-established the seat of the Vichy government in the town of Siegmaringen, but Laval refused to comply with the Germans in protest of his relocation, and Pétain had long since abandoned collaboration. The Free French were installed as the new French government following the liberation of Paris, stripping Pétain and Laval of what little power they had left. So as soon as uh, Paris was liberated, uh, again, whatever power Laval and uh, Pétain had is gone. Because the Free French were in control, and de Gaulle's in control. Finally, the Vichy government limped along until the Allies liberated Siegmaringen in 1945. With the war's end, it was time for Pétain to return to France. He was offered asylum by the Swiss, but steadfastly refused. The former dictator was adamant that the French people needed to hear his side of the story and stood trial. Pierre Laval was tried and executed by firing squad October 1945. Trial in 1945 under the auspices of the de Gaulle government. Pétain believed the Free French government was illegitimate, and save for delivering a prepared statement lauding the Vichy regime as protector of France, remained largely silent, refusing to dignify what he saw as a sham trial with his participation. So in other words, uh, Pétain was making the argument saying the Free French and de Gaulle are not legitimized governments of France, uh, 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 excuse me, is not a legitimate government of France, but my Vichy government is. I am, because I am pretty much the current power holder of France, the current leader of France. So technically, Vichy government is still the legitimate French government. Now, at this point, uh, the Allies were saying, you, the goal is our man. Whether we don't like him or we do like him, doesn't matter. He's our guy, you're not, so get fucked. The tribunal proceeded regardless, and Pétain was convicted of treason. The 89-year-old Pétain was sentenced to death, but de Gaulle personally commuted his sentence to life imprisonment at the court's request. The fallen idol of the French people was shuffled between a handful of prisons and private homes until his declining health led to his death in 1951. The reason why uh, de Gaulle spared his life is it could be a variety of reasons. One is he's too old to execute. So he's dying anyway. So that's just, or we're, we're just doing the guy a favor. And secondly, of course, there's other reasons such as uh, his status back in Verdun during the First World War and the efforts he put in. Uh, de Gaulle still recognizes that. That's why I think he spared his life. So, but you be, the, you guys be the judge. There is a popular image of France as the doormat upon which Germany wiped their jackboots on their way to conquering Europe. The fight for France was certainly uneven, but reducing the entire French war experience to simply surrendering ignores the nuanced and complicated truth of a nation brought low by a true force of evil. Mm -hmm. The Vichy regime was an attempt by a cabal of uncaring opportunists to reap the rewards of chaos a cavalcade of brown-nosing for personal profit paired with the very real collaboration of civilians and partisan fighters. Ironically, this fascinating and sinister facet of the Second World War 
is often overlooked in favor of the simplistic narrative of French surrender followed by the romantic struggle of the French resistance, a unified monolith struggling until the dawn of Allied liberation. But history, like truth, resists simplicity. The history of France, especially. There you have it. All right. Okay, so let's uh, briefly talk about the liberation of Paris. Okay, um... So, Hitler really didn't want Paris to be an allied hand. So, what he did is uh, he appoints a general named Dietrich von Schultitz, uh, a.k.a. the Smasher of Cities. Uh, he had his reputation back at uh, Sevastopol, like known to be bombing the living crap out of that city. So, that's why he Hitler appoints uh, Schultitz to uh, France. And to assure his officers' loyalty to Hitler... Uh, he makes this program. I, for, I forget what it's called, though, but basically he's saying that any officer disobeys Hitler, uh, not only he will get punished, though, but their families will get punished. So that was a way for Nazi officers to get in line. And okay. So he goes to Paris to. Uh, to seize control and by then uh when the uh when the allies uh, invaded france aka the uh the normandy invasion uh the paris police changed sides over time saying you know what fuck these guys fuck these nazis we're going to, we're going back to what, what we originally did do serve the parisian people so overnight they switched sides and uh along with the resistance oh, oh let's talk about uh uh, Jean Moulin, uh, the guy I was telling you about before, the uh, uh, the other guy that was uh, alongside De Gaulle. Okay, this guy was anti-Nazi, anti-Vichy. Uh, he was the uh, the figurehead of the resistance. Uh, in fact, uh, he personally went risked his life, went over to England just to meet with uh, De Gaulle himself. Uh, basically saying, "Hey, uh, all these connections in France, I know all these resistance." fighters uh if i can get them together we can you know band together and de gaulle is like all right we'll do that but under one condition i'll recognize these resist resistance members and award them but they have to recognize me as their leader de gaulle and we're gonna and we're gonna like unite as the united french army so to speak right and so uh mulan was like okay cool also, I will build the foundation of uh, the to uh, to build your resistance. So, okay. So at this point, uh, Moulin wanted to work with De Gaulle and not the British, uh, though the British didn't hold any grudges. So they're like, okay, cool, fine. We'll parachute you back to uh, Vichy territory, and you can do your thing. By his thing, I mean you know start talking to his various resistance groups that I listed before, and get them to get them working together. However, uh, Jean Moulin kind of faced a, I say, a, a grim fate. Okay, so I'll read your section on Jean Moulin. Jean Moulin has become a symbol of the French resistance to Nazi occupation. His role within the resistance was to unite or at least to coordinate the various factions fighting against the Nazis in May 1943. He called a secret summit of heads of the various organizations. Uh, the meeting in Lyon was raised by German troops. Okay, so he had he had like uh, supposed to be meeting to uh, what this with some various resistance groups, but he was compromised. Uh, so guys like yeah, pretty much uh, a couple guys, including Moulin himself, was captured by the Germans and was brutally, brutally interrogated by a German named Klaus Barbie, known as the Butcher of Lyon. This guy knows. This guy is known to, uh, in order to get answers out of you, he will torture someone you love the most, like your mother, or your sister, or your whatever, whatever you adore. Uh, he would even like get the mother of a French resistance fighter and send dogs after her right in front of him, just so he can get some answers. Like Klaus Barbie was a crazy ass Nazi. 
And uh, this guy ended up torturing and killing Mulan, trying to get some answers out of him. Though, but but he died without giving anything away. Of course, the death of Mulan was a huge, huge blow to uh, Resistance morale. Though, but however, even though after his death, he has built the foundation of the French Resistance. He's he already talked to all these various groups. They all already want to work together. They all they all already wanted to unite as one. Of course, even after death, they did it because in their minds, this is what Mulan wanted. So let's honor his death by uniting and fighting against the Nazis. And so therefore, that's when uh, the insurrection happened in Paris because the Parisians were saying, this occupation, we're fighting back. So men and women, especially women, that pretty much fought back against the Nazis. And of course, uh, they couldn't keep the fight for long uh, because they were running out of. Eventually, they were running out of weapons. They're running out of ammo, and they need help. They need help from the Allies. And so, while they were fighting, uh, Volna Koltitz uh, offered a temporary truce uh, just to get his troops out, uh, just to uh, you know collect the collect those wounded. Right. So the French uh, accepted it only because they want to seize an opportunity. So what they did. Or what Colonel Roll did was sent a messenger over to the Allied or, or to, over to the Allied lines in northern France, especially in the Normandy area. And so he makes it. Uh, first uh, commanding officer he sees was, of course, General Patton. And so the messenger told uh, was what told uh, Patton the dire situation is happening in Paris. They're running out of ammo. They're running out of weapons, and they're in a verge of collapse. And if we don't get any help immediately, Paris would share the same fate as Warsaw. Because remember the Warsaw up, uprising. Uh, they fought back. Uh, the, the residents of Warsaw fought, fought back against their Nazi occupiers, believing that the Soviets would come and relieve them or give them a hand. Though what Stalin ordered his generals to step aside and watch Warsaw collapse. So basically, uh, they... It was lamb to the slaughter, and the people of Warsaw wore the lamb, and it and Warsaw ended up became, becoming burnt to the ground. Uh, this is what the uh, resistance fighter was telling Patton: "It's like, dude, like we're gonna face the same fate if we don't get any help." Now, of course, uh, Paris was not in the what not in the Allied playbook because during the Normandy campaign, their plan is going straight to Germ straight to Berlin. They're not stopping by Paris. Like Paris was not like Paris is, you know, it, Paris had no uh, strategic value. That's why uh, they didn't they didn't want to go for it. Of course, De Gaulle was pissed because De Gaulle, uh, oh, they excluded De Gaulle from the Norman invasion, and now they want to exclude his capital. De Gaulle was livid. He was not going to have any of it. And so, but he he tried to convince uh, the other Allied uh, generals, though, but pretty unfazed until Eisenhower kind of overheard what's going on, and he's like, "Oh shit, maybe we should help these guys indefinitely." Um. So, what he did again had a change of heart and gave uh, De Gaulle the green light to go ahead and liberate Paris along with an American division he's going to send as well. So, De Gaulle is like, Hell yeah! Good enough for me. Let's go to Paris. And sure enough, uh, they came down to Paris and practically liberated it. And von Trotzitz really didn't blow up the city. Uh, he was ordered to by Hitler. Though, but, um, Koltitz really didn't do it. He was dogging Hitler, saying, "Yes, my yeah, my Führer, yeah, my Führer. The city will be, will be blown to bits, my Führer." Though, but he was kind of like playing with Hitler the entire time, because he he really didn't want to blow up Paris because he already has a bad reputation of destroying cities. Some say he didn't want that reputation anymore, so that's why he uh, he didn't want to blow up the city. Other reasons was because he knew he was going to lose. So he wanted to be rewarded for not blowing up the city. But again, you guys be the judge in that. 
No idea. So when uh okay. When Paris was liberated, uh you, you'll see the pic you will see the liberation picture of troops marching. And who's leading up the front? De Gaulle and his free French troops. Cause in his head, he needs to lead. Like if he's gonna see it as legitimate French leader, like he cannot have the Americans leading the, the parade because like that they'll be seen as okay, now the Americans gonna occupy um France. So he does not want the people to see that. He wants uh to, to people let to let the French know that France is gonna be occupied by the French. So what he does is he leads the uh, the parade in front, saying, "France, I have returned. We have returned." And guess what? And guess who we brought to the party? The Americans, the Canadians, the British, the Aussies, the Kiwis, practically the Allied Expeditionary Force. And that made a big impact uh, towards uh, De Gaulle's leadership. Now at this point. The allies, the allied leaders, like it or not, the goal is the de facto leader of France. Like they already built this guy up already from the BBC through um through uh, pro French propaganda, like stuff like that. Like they, they built this guy up so much to the point where like the Fran the French people don't want to follow anyone but the goal. So uh guys like Patton, Eisenhower were like, hey, you know what? This the goal. You're the leader. You're the French leader. You're recognized. And so there you have it. Uh is there anything else we want to talk about? All right. Well, except this one thing right here. Okay. Uh 2,200,000 the number of people who were honored by the post-war French government for the role in the resistance. But the total number of fighters is impossible to know. Being that there was, it's not like they kept a record of of any resistance fighters on which faction they fought under. Like, in fact, in order to join a resistance group, it's not like you know, you it's not like uh, you go to a website and sign online to uh, join this organization. No, no, that's not the case. You have to bump into one of the guys, uh, one of the uh, the resistance members, anyone close to them. Uh, pretty funny is uh the uh the, the pro uh, the pro communist uh, resistance groups, not all of them were actually communists, because it occurred to me that there are some Frenchmen. The reason why they joined them is because there were the closest ones they could see. There were there were, they, they were the uh, the only ones in their area in order to join resistance, like anything to throw a punch right back to the Nazis. No, there was there, there stuff like that. And yeah. Um, anything else I should talk about? No, I think that covers all of it. Down the Marco, Marco. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. This is the episode of the French Resistance. Um, yeah, that's uh pretty much what I got for you. Um, next episode, we're gonna talk about Operation Overlord. So one of my most favorite subjects to talk about uh especially i'm going to talk about more on juno beach uh because if you read if you look at uh western historians they always talk about when, when you see when we hear the normandy invasion people always think omaha beach utah beach almost as if the americans alone invaded northern france that is not the case because of course you have omaha and utah which is the americans you have Gold Beach, which is the British. You have Juno, our precious Canadians, which Juno Beach, oh, like Juno Beach is the most underrated beach in history. Because Juno, they like the Canadians in Juno Beach, like they suffer the same exact casualties as Omaha Beach. It was just as bloody as Omaha Beach, which is why we're gonna talk about it. Now, of course, you have Sword Beach, of course, another another British landing zone, but of course, and the, dif the differences they have elements, uh, elements of the French, the Polish, and, and the Norwegians. I think no, not the French because they they excluded the Gaulle. I totally forgot about that. So as far as I remember, it was the Poles and and the Nor and the Norwegians who participated who participated 
and Sword Beach. But we will talk about more about that next episode, along with uh, Hitler's assassination attempt. That uh, is, uh, I'm looking forward to talk about as well, uh, especially going uh, into uh, uh, the guy who tried to uh, assassinate, or who organized Operation Valkyrie, which is uh, a, a man named uh, Klaus von uh, Klaus von Stauffenberg. This guy was a anti-Nazi German patriot. We'll talk about more of the guy on the next episode. Though, so, but in the meantime, like the video on your way in, click the level up on this algorithm. And thank you for tuning in. Now, I'm going to go because I am starving and I want to eat. Though, <laughs> so, but till next time, guys, peace out and thank you for tuning in. Good night.